So I didn't realize this session is going to be the invasion of the Pythonistas. Uh, that'll make sense when we get a little bit later into my presentation. So I want to talk today about testing. One of the great things about Rust has been the fact that all of your basics are built into uh, Rust. You get dependency management, you get documentation, you get testing. If I can figure out what my click button is. There. So, I mean, it's actually pretty simple. You can just, it's a very low ceremony. You can just go ahead and annotate your function, do your asserts, just put this in the right files, and it just works. And nothing has really changed since then, actually. Um, even though that it's not necessarily scaling to what we have today. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Like, I've been hitting a lot of these pain points. Through all of my projects, I'm regularly interacting with these replacements for the existing cargo, uh, for the existing lib test harness. As a good example, this is the what cargo uses. We've basically shoehorned in our entire layer on top, and we have our own test macro and do all these sorts of things. And cargo add was mentioned. To get cargo add integrated into cargo, I had to go and rewrite every single test to switch from how libtest does things to how cargo does things. And that's losing one of those advantages that we have of having that built-in testing of the fact that, like, in theory, every project uses it. So you can just transfer from project to project and be able to automatically write tests and have it all work for you. That doesn't actually work when you, you're having to use all sorts of random test harnesses that all do things in different ways and might not even be compatible with each other. So that's one of the, so th there's, I've been hitting a lot of pain points with that. Also, I think a lot about um, a Church of Sweden bishop came up with these rules for having discussions among religions. I think this actually has a lot of application beyond religions. Like, well, maybe this is religion. Vim versus Emacs or Rust versus Go. Uh, the one I specifically want to highlight is the last one. Leave room for holy envy. That's where you look towards the other group and admire the things that they have, even if they don't necessarily fit within you. We were just talking about Python. There's a lot of benefits to static typing. There's a lot of benefits to result over exceptions, but there's some things that work a little bit better in Python because they have those features. And that's an opportunity for us to be able to have a holy envy for the Python community, to be able to recognize, hey, they have some strengths here. Like, we should be able to admire these. One of the specific ones that I have some holy envy for is how testing works in Python. We look at this snippet of some Python code that I wrote in a previous uh, form of my career. And we've got the ability to inject new uh, command line arguments. We are able to create fixtures, have runtime skippable tests, and it all just works until it doesn't. And then there's a lot of debugging pain associated with it. So, you know, but it is make it pretty trivial and easy to follow what's happening here. So it's like, how do we get this in Rust? How do I, like, we, like there's this gulf between what we have today and what, like what you could have with something like PyTest. So I'm going to talk about some of those areas where like I've been running into these disjoint things where I'm like, I just want it to be able to work right. The first of these is, oh, uh, it's sliding down as I go. Okay. The first of these is conditional ignores. You look at that uh, function, you're like, okay, cool. That function exists. Awesome. It passed. It, everything is good. I run thousands of tests in cargo and everything said everything was okay, so I know it all works. Well, except it turns out, I wonder how to fix the scroll on this. It turns out that there's actually this short circuit in the test and you don't know that from just running your test. You think everything works, everything is peachy dory. Um, cargo actually does use its uh, custom test harness to take advantage of this where it uses its macros to, at build time, check to see if Mercurial is installed in your system and ignores your test, and then te statically tells libtest, hey, it's ignored for this reason. So you actually do get a nice printed message, but we probably shouldn't be at compile time checking to see if Mercurial is installed in your system. That's a little funky. But in PyTest, this is pretty trivial in that it, you just say, hey, does the hg command exist? If so, skip the test and I'll report it, and it just works. That'd be great if we were able to have something like that within Python. I'm sorry, within Rust, other way around. So another one is, well, there's a lot of talk of fixtures. Oh, I want setup and teardown. I want PyTest fixtures. We have RAI. That, that gives us fixtures, right? Well, except I've actually run into a problem in one of my programs where a lot of things that you might treat as a fixture, like, say, creating a temp directory, 
those on drop will ignore errors because panicking in drop is problematic. And so I've actually run into problems where bugs in my tests were masked because of this, because of weird file system issues on Windows compared to other platforms. And so I'd be really great if we had a way to be able to easily make sure that uh, close was called on all my tests rather than me having to go in and hand put in the close everywhere. That would be a great aspect of having a form of fixture support. Let me just see if I don't know what's going on here. Anyways, Alex, if, I don't know if you want to just mess with the laptop while I work on this to try and fix this because uh, now it's starting to go off screen. But we at least see the important part that we can just, if this were Python, we could just be able to make that uh, reference to a fixture and we just get it. It'll take care of the uh, teardown and all that stuff for you. Another way that this is able to help us is... <laughs> Thank you. Another thing that ties into the uh, value of fixtures is Cargo, in its test, it has a custom set of uh, tempter fixtures that allows it to create the temp directory for you and actually leak it and not clean it up until the next run of the test. That way, if your test fails, you know you see all of your test output of why it failed, but you can actually go into the file system and actually inspect the files of what it did. So you can actually be like, oh, that's why, because that's not being printed to the screen. It's on the disk. And, but if you're just using a regular temp directory, it gets cleaned up automatically, and you can't see any of that. And, but then you run into another problem of, oh, it's leaking all of the tests. It's not cleaning up after, uh, on, uh, on the run. So when you run this in CI, it's easy to run out of disk space. So now you want your fixture to be able to help you identify what are all of your uh, tests that take up the most disk, disk space. So if your fixture could be able to, uh, if you could have a tempter fixture and it could report, oh, at the end of test, the, the tempter was this big, that'd be a great thing. And that's all things you can be able to do when you have a more flexible fixture system than if you just said, oh, RII will take care of it. Let's just step away from this. The next one is a lack of, t of data generation for tests. This is taken from t uh, Toml at its tests. And this is the most basic way of doing it. You just loop over it. But now, without you having to do something uh, more complex, the naive way of implementing this, you don't have the context of which iteration of the loop this failed on, which input is what caused the failure. And then you also have to make sure that all of your entries are done in a very specific order because you might have a more complex case before an er uh, a simpler case. And then your debugging this is like, well, if I had that simpler case earlier, it would have been much easier to debug this problem. And sometimes it's easier to get the big picture of, oh, these five tests failed. Oh, this must be the common thread between these failures. But when you're having to deal with them serially like this, it makes it so you can't see that bigger picture. Or another problem with this is, well, if you have a bunch of debug output you're putting out to try and figure out what's going on, you need the debug output of all those other runs, and that's just uh, making it harder to cipher through all this. So you might go through and like make macros to try and make this a little bit easier for yourself, or you might just go and write a custom test harness to be able to go do this. And that's where we have some things like try build, which, will, which is especially helpful for proc macros, where you can be able to just, hey, here's some Rust code, make sure it compiles, or here's some Rust code, make sure it has a good error message to it. But this isn't a first class experience in using this. You have to put this in a separate binary. It's output is a little bit different. You have a really weird way of interacting with it on the command line that's not obvious and not reported within the help. And you then also have these magic environment variables you have to set to be able to interact with this. This isn't the regular experience. This is, again, one of those not quite what the uh, promised ubiquity of test experience that you are expected to get. But if this were all in PyTest, this would be a lot simpler. You would just have your a function to enumerate all of your uh, test cases, and you just call a function to verify each of those test cases, and you're done. This is all reported. This is all treated as this will automatically be individual tests reported in your output, and it just works. So I feel like the common thread to all of this is an issue of scaling up as you get to larger projects. Like libtest works great if you're just doing some quick throw together a very simple hello world program, and then you, but it doesn't when you get into some, anything more complex or anything bigger, and it requires you to go through some extra hoops before you get to that. It requires you to go through a lot of pain before you invest in these larger tools like writing your own test harness for being able to take care of these things. 
So what is our path forward for this? As you kind of hinted, I've been admiring a lot of the things that PyTest gives us. And lo looking through these problems, I feel like a PyTest model actually helps solve some of these problems. So maybe if we could be able to find a way to be able to make things a little bit more PyTest-like, we can actually have these things all unified rather than putting our hands up in the air and saying, well, you get libtest or you get nothing. And you have to go and write it all from scratch. So I've actually been working through this and starting to write a custom test harness that is a proposed new lib test. And it's uh, being mo uh, modeled to eventually allow it to be able to have a PyTest experience to this. And I've, right now I'm at the point of being able to just mimic lib te uh, be a copy of libtest to mimic. I'm just right now working on the benchmark side of that. That's the only thing that's left before I'm able to start looking at replacing the full libtest. But then my plan for this is the biggest hurdle to any of this, that last step of merge this into the uh, Rust standard library, that's going to require, that's a large service area to stabilize. And so there's different things I'm thinking through and going to be talking with the libs team about of how do we allow this to be able to move forward and get stabilized and be able to be used out. I think that's where I'm focusing on the minimum of what I want to get stabilized is just the extension, API extension points to allow a PyTest crate to be able to be written on top of libtest. And maybe eventually someday we stabilize the rest of those features as well, we stabilize an actual fixtures macro and things like that. But just starting with just providing the, uh, the programmatic extension points and allowing experimentation on top of that before we get to that point. The other side to this is maybe none of this gets stabilized. But I think one valuable thing from this exercise is actually the fact that this is an opportunity to experiment with the JSON output of libtest, which that's a key thing. So some of you might have heard of the, say, Cargo Next Test project, which is experimenting with how do you actually run all of these tests from your harnesses. And one of the things that's important for that is the JSON output, and there's limitations and problems with that. And I've, the way I've been writing this is I've been writing it so that all of the nice user interface aspects of this are written based off of the JSON output. So I'm dogfooding it, so I'm be able to give a better report of, hey, here's what, what works, here's what doesn't work for this. We can get that stabilized and be able to move that forward. That's also why I started with the lib test side of things and not the cargo test side of things, so to be able to help provide that feedback loop to be able to make things better to help lead in towards the cargo test side of things. So the things that I could see uh, you all could be able to help me with this on is, what do you have holy envy for? What have you had experience with that I have not of, oh, they have this thing in this text uh, t uh, environment. What could we be able to learn from that to be able to help improve Rust's testing? But also, what oddball test scenarios have you guys come across so that you can, we can be able to make sure we take that in and design an account for that? You could also just help contribute to the project in the discussions, watch what's going on, maybe contribute some features. You could also help me offload some of my work. This is actually my lowest priority right now because I, it's important for me to finish what I've already started. I've got a couple of RFCs I need to move forward and some features for CLAP and things like that. This is right now kind of my filler project while I'm blocked and waiting on other things. So that'd be a great thing. Want to go write some CLAP features? Go for it. And that is it. Thank you all very much. We're running a little late, but we have time for like two questions, so we got two hands right there. Um, so do you think there's any way to improve testing for, for example, no STD or embedded targets in any way? Because that's something Rust really doesn't support at the moment, while it is a target of the language. So I personally don't really deal with uh, those scenarios, so I can't speak directly to them, but that'd be a great conversation for us to have separate so we can dig into what the actual requirements are. Either feel free to catch me or just go on the repo and create an issue and let's start having a conversation about that. Let's do that. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm new to us, so maybe it already exists, but do you have the doc test uh, part of the Python? So Rust does have doc tests built in. So if you do cargo test, it'll just go ahead and test your documentation for you, and it's great. That's actually one of the things that I'm hoping to be able to improve about this is it's kind of like shoehorned in on the implementation side. I'd love to try and use this work to actually make it a bit more first class, which would then help cargo next test any future cargo test improvements. So yes, it is supported. I hope to make it better with this. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ed. Uh, I've definitely run into some some of those pain points. It would be lovely to see it improved. <laughs>